Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our series Science and Quran, the story of sunshine and iron. We've taken a wonderful journey together and we would like to end with just a few final reflections. We talked about how hydrogen fusion is what fuels the sun, how that is intimately related to E equals mc squared, how that is different from burning wood or burning coal. And now let us trace one more amazing and I think very misunderstood verse that I think we now have the knowledge to understand in a completely new and different and inshallah in a more accurate way. So let's go right to the verse and then we'll come to its explanation. It is the beginning of Surah At-Takwir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ida shamsu kuwirat. This verse has been translated when the sun, with its spacious light, is folded up. That's Yusuf Ali's translation. Pikthal's translation is when the sun is overthrown. Al-Tabari, one of the great classical old tafsirs, says this means that the sun will be darkened. And uh, Ibn Jubair one of the companions in his commentary on the Qur'an said that kuwirat means that it will sink. So this is how this verse had been understood. Now let's return here and ask the question, what happens when the sun uses up its hydrogen? We said it's fusing its hydrogen into helium. Well, the sun only has a finite supply of hydrogen. Enough, inshallah, to have kept it burning for about four and a half billion years, and scientists estimate about another five billion years, so nothing to panic over. But at some point, the sun will finish up its supply of hydrogen. What do scientists think will happen then? And you see that scientists are not speaking off the cuff. They have done very detailed calculations, very detailed models, and they very firmly believe that stars like our sun, known as main sequence stars, that a star that is roughly the mass of our sun, when it uses up its hydrogen, and then it has mostly helium, well, remember Eddington. He said the reason the sun didn't collapse under its own weight was because of the energy from hydrogen fusing into helium. When that hydrogen is used up, now we can't fuse hydrogen to helium to balance the gravitational pull of the sun, and all of a sudden the sun begins to sink inward. The outer layers begin to sink inward under their own weight. When that happens, then the helium will be squeezed together with tremendous force, and the inner core will heat up even more and now the helium will begin to fuse into something like carbon. And that very rapid contraction with the fusion of helium into hydrogen will produce a tremendous burst of energy. And that burst of energy will cause the sun to expand. And you know that scientists have said that the expected fate of our sun is that it will end up in something known as the red giant. And that red giant, in fact, will be so big as to be approximately a hundred million miles in diameter. What does that mean? That means the sun, its outer surface will grow so big that it will engulf the earth and the moon. Now let's go back to the original Arabic meaning of kawara. Kawara, that verb means to roll and enlarge. For example, they say, Kawara al He rolled up and balled up his turban. To ball up, to conglomerate, to agglomerate. And so, that means, Kawara means to make something into a large ball. And according to Lisan al Arab, that is its meaning except when it refers to the Quranic verse because people couldn't understand how could the sun become a very large ball. 
you couldn't apply the primary meaning of Ida Shamsu Kuwirat to this verse in any way that people from the Prophet's time until the mid 1900s could understand in any sensible way. But now that we understand that the fate of our son is to indeed become a very large red ball of light and heat, fusing helium, we can understand that the primary meaning of Ida Shamsu Kuwirat may very well be a reference to this red giant face. To me, that is absolutely astounding. And it is something that can be appreciated only through study and through knowledge. And that really is the aim of this course. Now let's look at one final thing. What is the end of the road in stellar nucleosynthesis? We said that a star will fuse hydrogen into helium. Then deeper inside, helium will fuse into carbon carbon to neon, neon to oxygen, oxygen to silicon. And as the star exhausts each one of these, when all of the hydrogen is turned to helium, the helium will fuse to carbon. The carbon will fuse to neon. And the sun will be contracting, contracting. Some of the stars will become a red giant. Others will keep contracting. But the deeper we go into the core and the more of its fuel the sun exhausts, it will continue these cycles of fusion. There's nothing so terribly special about getting energy from fu fusing hydrogen to helium. We can fuse helium to carbon and get energy. We can fuse carbon to neon and get energy. And look at this quote from uh, the wonderful book Symmetry in the Beautiful Universe by Leon Letterman and Christopher Hill. Leon Letterman, by the way, is a Nobel laureate in physics. And he says, the sequence of fusion proceeds manufacturing ever heavier atoms within the nuclear furnace of stellar interiors until it reaches the element iron. Iron is the most stable atomic nucleus and together with those of the heavier elements will not yield more energy by fusing with other atomic nuclei. Iron marks the end of the available fuel of a star and the ultimate end of life of a star. And so the fusion process will continue until iron is produced. In some stars, those which are destined to become supernovas, the star then explodes and releases that iron as interstellar debris. And it is that iron which got incorporated into the Earth when the planet Earth formed. And that is the reason we have iron on Earth. And I, as a teenager, and even as a young adult, was completely baffled by this verse from Surah Al-Hadid. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ I won't translate this first part of the verse. وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ And we have brought down iron from on high, we have bestowed it from on high, in which there is awesome power as well of a source of benefits for man. And I could never understand why would the Quran say, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيد أَنزَلْنَا means we brought it down from the sky. Like when the Quran says uh, in Surah An-Nabah, uh, وَأَنزَلْنَا مَا أَن ثَجَّاجَ right? وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَا أَن ثَجَّاجَ that we have brought down from the clouds plentiful water, right? So anzalna means we brought it down from the sky. And that is how the Qur'an uses anzalna. And I would ask myself, how would the Qur'an use this word for iron? We dig up iron from the ground. It doesn't come down from the sky. And then when I learned about the chain of stellar nucleosynthesis and how the last stop, the most stable nucleus is iron, and beyond iron, a star cannot get any more energy from fusion. And so, when it reaches the stage of iron, if the star is big enough, now it will begin to collapse under its own weight. You can't do any more fusion to get any more energy to balance the collapse. And then it will rebound, if the star is big enough, into a tremendous explosion, and that is known as the supernova. And 
The iron and the other heavy elements will spill out into the interstellar debris, and indeed, iron has come down to us from the sky. Subhanallah, that is an absolutely amazing um, synthesis and an absolutely amazing subtlety in the phraseology that the Quran uses. And notice this, that any star starts off with a given amount of hydrogen, a bit of helium, starts the fusion, that is finite. Eventually, it will reach the end of its road, each and every star. How long it will live depends on how big it was, how fast it burns the hydrogen, but as Professors Letterman and Hill say iron marks the end of the available fuel of a star and the ultimate end of life of a star. And so every star at its birth already is programmed to die at a certain time. There is a given lifespan. And so I love this quote by Ernest Rutherford, whom we have met a couple of times now in this series, he says, all of physics is either impossible or trivial. It's impossible until you understand it, and then it becomes trivial. Well, I wouldn't say this stuff is trivial, but when we understand, then we can look back and see the Quran in a different light. And let us end with this verse from Surah Al-Zumar. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق يكور الليل على النهار ويكور النهار على الليل وسخر الشمس والقمر كل يجري لأجل مسمى ألا هو العزيز الغفار That he it is who created the heavens and the earth in accordance with an inner truth. And by understanding some of these processes, and again we will come to these processes once again at a deeper level, we are beginning to touch some of that inner truth. He causes the night to flow into the day, he causes the day to flow into the night, the rotation of the earth around the sun, and he has made the sun and the moon subservient to his laws, or maybe even subservient to the needs of our life on earth. The sun burning with fusion, constantly giving us the heat and the light to store the chemical potential energy in the food that we eat and the fuel that we burn each running its course for a term set by him, right? كُلٌ يَجْرِي لِأَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى And indeed, each of these, the earth has a term, the moon has a term, the sun has a term, and eventually the life of the sun will end, and we now have a glimpse of why and how that happens, not just to the sun, but to every star. Is not he the Almighty? the forgiving. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enhance us in our understanding, in our appreciation of the majesty of the universe that he has created, and to make for us in that understanding and appreciation a source of his mercy and his forgiveness. I hope you will continue to join us for the rest of this series. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.